Good morning, church. I, you, you need to know one thing about me. I love Jesus and I love the church. Okay? My heart gets reggae, but my feet don't. <laughs> it's all in here, but it doesn't come down there. I don't know. It just doesn't happen. Uh, I want to I share one simple idea today with you. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to uh, 1 John chapter 4. And you know this passage, and you've heard this passage before. Uh, but I want to get at one simple idea this morning. 1 John chapter 4, starting with verse 16. It, it starts in the middle of verse 16 there. And here it is. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says... I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother who he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. I want to talk about one simple idea. It's, it's related to the vision statement of, uh, of your pastor, the vision statement for the church, that restoration, fellowship is about restoring people to their rightful position in Christ. It's related to that. That's a pretty complicated way of saying what I want to say, because I want to say it in a simple way. Uh, my older son, I've got two sons, uh, he's a professor of marketing at a business school in Boston. You know, I'm, he's in Boston. And uh, he tells me how complicated things are when, when companies do their marketing plans. And he does research in marketing. So I, I, I went to a website and looked at one of these marketing plans for a, a major, a major uh, business in, in the United States. And here's their marketing plan, a little bit of their marketing plan. Um, our marketing plan includes a coordinated program of television, print, radio, outdoor signage, internet, and point-of-sale media promotions, which ensures that our marketing message is consistently presented across all of our markets. This company operates approximately 2,300 company-operated stores and kiosks. We utilize a mix of direct, indirect, and alternative distribution channels. Plus, we do all this in our international uh, branch, in our government branch, and all of this has been in planning since 2009. You think in this 21st century that maybe God needs a marketing plan? I mean, think about all the lost people in this world. Does God need a marketing plan? At least a strategy to get, to get the word out to all those people. Well, no, we all kind of agree that God has given us a mission. Go everywhere, tell everyone. That's the mission. Maybe that needs a, a marketing plan, a, a strategy. You know, a lot of times churches, they get very involved with planning a, a marketing plan to do God's work in this world. So we commission missionaries. Now, I, you know, I, I love missionaries. I grew up in a family that loved missionaries. And I'm so excited to see what you did with Malawi. But, but you know... There were eight that went, and by my count, that left 592 of you were not missionaries at that time. So, so it was just simple math. I want to keep this as pretty, as simple as we can. I can't help but, but feeling that we're making too much of this whole idea that God needs a marketing plan. You know, here's what we do. We, we, devise, we devise programs, we have trainings, we have committee meetings, we have budgets, we have committee meetings, we have calendars and facilities and committee meetings and oversight and agenda and minutes and committee meetings, all quite complicated. 
I want to share with you a simple idea that you can start working on today. Because I believe this is God's marketing plan. It's a simple idea. I'm going to tell you right now what I believe God's marketing plan is. It's you. Turn to your neighbor, turn to the person beside you, and tell them, it's you. It's you. That's God's marketing plan. It's you. Marketing plan for his missions. Let me unwrap that just a little bit. God's marketing plan for the mission of the gospel to change the world is for you to love your neighbor until your neighbor knows that they're loved. For you to love your neighbor until your neighbor knows that they're loved. Simple, profound, life-changing, neighborhood-changing plan that is God's marketing strategy. You, with your love, your affection, your kindness, your friendship, your attention to your neighbors, you love your neighbors until they know that they are loved. See, I believe that most of the time in churches we have substitute our good intentions for the actual kindness of the gospel that penetrates into our neighborhoods, to our next door neighbors. Well, I know you don't hate your neighbors. Well, that's sort of good enough, right? But you see, I don't believe that's what God calls us to. I think God's marketing plan is for you to love your neighbors until your neighbors know that they are loved. I read a very disturbing thing. It's a, it was a survey of international college students that came to the United States. And you know, there are, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of international students that come to the United States and study in our universities. The average international student never gets inside of American home with an American family. When you look at the radicals across the world, many of the radicals across the world who are now attacking America studied in America. And nobody took the time to invite them home for a meal, a home-cooked meal. They never celebrated Thanksgiving in an American home. They never celebrated Christmas in an American home. They were isolated in their own little cluster in the university, and they never, ever met an American family. 98% of those never spent time with an American family. I believe it's God's marketing plan for us to love our neighbors. Not our good intentions. This is measurable, and we measure it by asking our neighbors, if, so if I went to your neighborhood, knocked on the door next door, and they came to the door, said hello, I said, I'm... I'm, uh, I'm the Rev from Restoration, and I, I want to know if the Smiths that live in the house next to you, do, do they love you? What do you think would be their report? It's, it's measurable, see? It's real. Let's get down to real simple, real simple strategy. It, we can measure this. God wants you to love your neighbors until your neighbors know have experience, can say for sure that they are loved. What do you suppose would happen in Aurora, in Denver, if this fellowship, 600 strong, began to put that mission into practice every day, every week, every month? What would happen? Would you, do you believe that God's mission in this world to love the world to tell everybody everywhere do you think it would be advanced would it be would it move forward if you began to love your neighbors so that your neighbors knew that they were loved so what does it mean well our text this morning says we can be bold in our love we can be bold in our love why can we both be bold in our love because god has loved us first 
That is the one thing you need to know in your heart of hearts, that God loves you, and so you have everything you need for life and godliness to do what God has asked you to do, which is to love your neighbors. Be intentional. That's way too often we choose good intentions, but we don't follow through with the actions to, to, to love our neighbors tangibly, in real ways to express that. Uh, have, if I were to do a quiz today, if you had, I say to, if this was school, and I say take out your pen and your, pe and your piece of paper, write your name on the top of it, and I want you to list to 10, well, 1 through 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10. And, and I want you to put the names, first and last names, of your 10 closest neighbors. Okay? Now, how can you love your neighbors if you don't, if you don't know who they are? Okay? You understand what I'm talking about? I'm talking about a simple idea is get to know who your neighbors are. First of all, learn their names. Name them so that your neighbor's on the right, your neighbor's on the left, your front door neighbors, your back door neighbors. Who in the world are they? Do you know them? How can you have an intentional strategy of praying for your neighbors, praying that the gospel would come and engage your neighborhood if you don't know who you're praying for? I, you know, come on, come, you know, so you, you, you put your hand up and say to, you, to your, God bless them, whoever they are. Some, somebody lives over there, Lord, bless them somehow. And I believe that God puts you there so that you would be the one who would bless your neighbors. That's, that's what God put you there. To find some commonalities. I, when we lived in the Philadelphia area, my wife Kathy and I enjoy gardening. We like to do the flower garden in the front, you know, and plant the tulip bulbs. First year there, we went out and bought 50 tulip bulbs. Planted them in beautiful... Uh, arrangement of tulip balls, bulbs across the front. What we didn't know is that in that neighborhood, because it was close to the creek, there, there were deer. Horned rats. And when the tulips came up and they just got just about ready to bloom, the deer came and chewed the tops of every single one of my tulips off. But we like to fuss in the garden. We like to have a little vegetable garden. And, and Turned out that our neighbors across the street, Nate, their 10-year-old, their was a, a Cub Scout, Boy Scout, and he had a, a project to plant a garden. And they said to us, you seem to know something about gardening. Can you help Nate figure out his garden stuff? And all of a sudden, we had a commonality. We had a place where we could talk about planting seeds and watering it. And, and so when they went to go on vacation and, and leave for a week, Nate came to me and said, uh, Mr. Fombell, could you water my garden while we're gone? Okay, so out of that garden came a friendship. Out of that friendship came opportunity to love them. And, and if we asked them, do you think that we loved you, they would say, yeah, you took care of our garden for us. You, you did things for us that, that nobody else could do. You were there when we needed you. Now, I don't know your neighbors, but, but I know that there is commonality. There's things that you like to do already that if you would find ways to connect with them about those things, you would have a natural pathway to love them and care for them. Uh, it could be the conversation on the, the sidewalk. It, it, it could be that you decide to have a block party and you host the block party, invite the, the neighbors to, to a picnic on your street. There's, a, there's a, a thousand strategies. I don't know your neighborhood, but you've got to know your neighborhood. You've got to do the work of figuring out what's going on in your neighborhood that you can serve, that you can bless, that you can tangibly, in actuality, be engaged with the lives of your neighbors. The church's vision says that we ought to be engaged with the folks around us spiritually, physically, socially, economically, educationally. Those are the core values of this church. Well, choose one of them. I guarantee that in your neighborhood there's an educational need. 
I guarantee that there are places in your neighborhood with kids that need tutors, encouragement, homework help. They, there's, there's an educational need in your neighborhood. I, I guarantee if you spend some time, you'll find somebody that you can love and help them do their homework so that they will be successful in school. There's an elementary school close by to you. You ought to be engaged with that. There's a middle school that needs, that needs the tangible presence of God's people with it. There are places in every neighborhood where you are there and you can make a difference in that. Our, uh, our habit is to do something at Christmas time for our neighbors. Kathy makes these little peanut butter things dipped in chocolate. They are so rich. And, and we put about a dozen of those in little Christmas bags and we take them to each of our neighbors. And we, we just, we, we do it late just before Christmas because we don't want them to buy us stuff. Like, I don't need any more stuff. I got enough stuff. But we we found that, and it's amazing, when you take a, a little Christmas bag full of chocolates to your neighbor, this tangible, simple, easy thing, how much they begin to think of you as not a stranger, but as a neighbor. I read this little blog, and it was said that it was, this, it was the six most horrifying questions that a believer in Christ could ever hear. The six most horrifying words that, 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 that a Christian could ever hear. Here are the six most horrifying words according to this blog I read just yesterday. I, I didn't know you're a Christian. I didn't know you're a Christian. In your neighborhood, do they know? Have they experienced your love and kindness? There's the, the pathway. You are God's strategy for marketing the gospel. You. Second thing. I know that you went through all of the work to find the house that you live in. Whether it's an apartment or a condo or a single family house. I know you went to the real estate people and you looked in the paper, and, and you looked at several places, and I, th I know you believe that you chose that house. And I'm going to tell you, you didn't just chose that house. God put you there. God put you there. He, he used your stuff. Yeah, I, 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 he used the real estate agent. He used the... He used all the, the newspaper ads and all. He used that. But I, I will say to you, because I believe in the, the almighty God who is at work in our lives, he's at work all around us, I believe that God put you in your home so that he could use you there to love those neighbors. Not happenstance. Now, I know you're going to say to me, but you don't know my neighbors. You don't know the kind of neighbors God put next to me. <laughs> Last October, um, we had planted some things in the front, and uh, our next-door neighbor started parking his truck on our, our part of the sidewalk and curb, you know. And, and my, my wife just said, you know, it's, it's keeping me from seeing those pretty flowers that we just planted. And so I made the mistake of saying to my neighbor, any chance you could move your truck a little bit onto your side of the line. Oh, my goodness, you'd have thought that I, you know, I asked him to uh, give a, a gallon of blood or something. I mean, oh, my goodness. And I had to go over afterwards when he was angry and bustling and, and just, you know, just full of venom and said, hey, wait, I just want to be neighbors. I just, just wanted to be neighbors. I just wanted us to get along. And I'm sorry if I offended you. I understand the kind of neighbors you have because I have the same kind of neighbors. I don't see in the book where that was an exception clause. You know, love your neighbors except if they're that kind of people. I don't see that kind of exception clause anywhere in the book. Do you? God says simply, I guess, love your neighbors. You know, I said this is a simple idea. I didn't say E-A-S-Y. I, I have not ever used that word Okay? Never said that this was easy. I'm just saying this is what was commanded of us. 
and what is right and what is just and what is God's strategy to change the world is for you to love your neighbors until your neighbors know they're loved. <laughs> we can do this because God loves us. See, when God fills us with his love, it splashes over. It becomes contagious. It becomes, it becomes a, a overflow in our own lives. Our problem sometimes is we don't really believe that God has filled us with, our, with his love. But when we understand that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness, and he fills us with, our, with his love, and we worship him and praise him because he has filled us, then we have something to give. We give out of what he has given to us. And, and this is the part that I have to keep working on. We do this because God loves our neighbors just every bit as much as he loves us. God says, I don't show favorites. With God, there's no favorites. Now, it, I, I believe it's better for you to be worshiping, but, but God doesn't love you more because you worship today. He already loved you all, all he could love you. He loved you, loved you totally and completely. And he loves your neighbors just as much as he loves you. He passionately loves your neighbors. He desperately loves your neighbors. You know why I know he desperately loves your neighbors? He sent his son for your neighbors. Jesus died for your neighbors just as much as he died for you. And, and when we begin to understand the depth and power of the gospel is that level of love. God loves your neighbors. I mean, the irreligious neighbors you've got that make fun of your faith, the, the potheads and gangbangers, the up-and-outers, the, the, those getting busy, getting rich, all, all those people, he loves them. And he doesn't love them less than he loves you. He, he loves them the same as he loves you. Uh, you, you know, uh, we've looked at one text. I just want to give you a taste of, of the range of this idea through Scripture. This is not just isolated in one little part of Scripture. This is not just in, in, the God, in 1 John here. So uh, in uh, Leviticus, the Old Testament Levitical law, do not hate your brother in your heart. Re rebuke your neighbor frankly so you do not have to share in his guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear grudge against one of your neighbors. But love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Leviticus 19, 15 through 18. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. I am the Lord. That comes with the authority of a direct command from God to his people. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 27 through 29. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, Come back later, I'll give it to you tomorrow when you have it now with you. Do not plot against your neighbor who lives trustfully next to you. What this verse says, you got it, give it. You got it. You got it in your hand, your neighbor needs it. Give it. This is not something I'm making up here. This is God's word to us. Don't say to your neighbor, come back later. If you got it, give it. What have you got that wasn't given to you already? Hold your possessions lightly. They were entrusted to you as a wise steward to be used for the kingdom of God. If you got it, practice generously giving it. You know, the, Jesus said the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. What is it? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. All of the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. It's the word of Jesus. This is not my making this up. This is not my trying to manipulate you to think you should do something you don't want to do. This is, this is the word of God that comes directly from the mouth of Jesus. You know, uh, when, when a, a man heard this, he, he tried to justify himself, and he came to Jesus and said, well, Jesus, how am I supposed to know who my neighbor is? You know, he was trying to get out of loving his neighbor. He understood exactly what Jesus said. And, and you remember the, the parable that Jesus told about the, the Samaritan. 
But what, who was the neighbor in that? The man who had need. The good Samaritan was a good neighbor because he saw the man's need and he gave what he had to care for the man's need. Romans chapter 15, verses 2 and 3. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. So that Jesus showed us that we ought to give to our neighbor to build our neighbors up. Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 17. Serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. And James chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, if you really keep the royal law, the royal law, the law that came from Jesus as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, this is the royal law. And if you keep the royal law, what's the royal law? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. This has the authority of the Old Testament law, the wisdom of the Proverbs, the insight of the Gospels, and the commandment of Jesus is Love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is not a hard thing to understand. It's just sometimes hard to do. It's just hard to do. Because we're afraid. But perfect love casts out fear. <laughs> You see how, how God has anticipated us? He's taken away all the excuses. Is this going to be tough? Yeah, it's going to be tough, but I'll be with you. Do I have anything to give? Yeah, I love you completely, so you have something to give. But, but, but what if? I'm afraid. Yeah, perfect love casts out fear. He deals with all of our excuses for why we shouldn't do what we all know is precisely what Jesus has called us to do. Third thing. It seems to me that the, the, the real power in all of this is when we trust the Spirit of God to make it obvious to us. We trust the Spirit of God to work in us, to move us, so that we have a genuine, deep, kind, loving spirit towards our neighbors. That is not nat the natural thing, but that is the spiritual thing to love our neighbors. So one of the, the strategies is just to simply ask the Holy Spirit to sensitize you to the needs of your neighbor and motivate you to serve them in Christ's love. So sometimes the Spirit of God will open our eyes and we'll see the needs of our neighbors. And then we have the responsibility when we see them to find a strategy and a way to meet the needs that we give. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is like behind us. <clears throat> you ever experienced that? I don't want to do that, Lord. Oh, you know, and you find yourself suddenly propelled into the moment, and you know you're there because the Spirit of God pushed you into that moment. What's the, um, the song which we just sang? The, the sound of heaven touching earth. How would your neighbor describe the sound of heaven touching earth? It will sound like your voice. It will sound like you knocking on their door with a pie. It will sound like you helping them do their yard work or cleaning their sidewalk or helping them wash their car. It will be because you have chosen to do some kind thing. That's how they will hear the sound of heaven. That's how they will hear the sound of heaven. Let's not make this some, somehow some theological reflection of, of, of some profound, uh, uh, unattainable things. This is about you being kind to your neighbor because the Spirit of God has opened your eyes for you to see the needs in your neighborhood, the needs in your next door neighbors. Every one of your neighbors will benefit from your love. Every one of your neighbors. So this sunset, first of all, this sort of self-assessment, do I accept God's love enough so that I can love my neighbors. I mean, so it starts with us being in the presence of God's people and understanding the gospel it means that God loves you, period. God loves you. Just the way you are with all the stuff you bring, all the issues you have, 
His, his love is not diminished one bit because of all your stuff. He still loves you. It gives us a basis. So part of our work here is this self-assessment. Self I'm loved. I am loved. I'm, I'm one of the beloved of the Father. I am loved. And some of this work of the Spirit occurs in me. So that, that's what happens. Where the Spirit works in our spirit so that we know that we really are the children of the Heavenly Father. We know we know. We're His. We belong to the Heavenly Father. Uh, the second thing is that... Uh, the Holy Spirit's at work all around us. One of the most fun parts of, uh, of beginning to love your neighbor is that the Spirit of God goes ahead of you and prepares your neighbors to receive the love of God that you're going to express to them. Do you remember what, what Blackaby said? God is at work all around us, all the time. God is moving in, in the midst of Aurora, doing things that God wants to do here. And occasionally, he allows us to join him in his work. When you step out in faith and say, I am going to do something for my neighbor in God's love, you will be shocked because God has already been there. God has already started to do the work. God has already sensitized their hearts to receive the kindness that you're about to pour out. Because God is at work all around us all the time and only occasionally. And so when we step in obedience to do what God has asked us to do, those are those moments when we, we are able to join God in his work in this world. I, I told my neighbor once that I, I had preached uh, a sermon on love your neighbors. He laughed. He laughed. He's that kind of a neighbor. He laughed. And uh, I said to him, I, I heard God laughing when, when uh, I preached the sermon on love your neighbors. And he got that, you know. How, he got it, that, that, that uh, he was not an easy neighbor to love. He, I said, I heard God laughing when I preached the sermon on love your neighbors. And he started to laugh too. And I, and I, I said... I heard God laughing when I mentioned you in my prayers. And he, started, he just laughed. Kind of, kind of a little sarcastic laugh, but he just laughed. And two days later, he said to me, do you really pray for us? I just lost my job. Would you pray for me? I didn't change his heart. The Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. What, why can we be bold and why don't we have to be afraid? Because the Spirit of God is at work and his love is being poured out. You know, God sends the rain on the just and the unjust. He sends his kindness on the just and the unjust. And, and when we find it in our hearts to be obedient to what God has called us to do. We, we don't have to be afraid. What, what, what if they reject it? They're, they're not rejecting us. They're rejecting the good word and the love of God that's poured out in his spirit that's already at work in their lives. Do you have a plan to love your neighbors? Okay, I'm giving you step one is figure out who they are. Who are you anyway? Now, no, just think about all the ways that you could have neighbors. The desk next to yours at, 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 at your work, okay? The, the, the class that you're engaged with at, at, in the school that you're involved with, the, the, the co-workers that you have, those are all your neighbors, okay? The, and then the people that live in the front door, back door, left side, right side, those are your direct neighbors. Those are in your sphere of influence. That sphere of influence, the place where, where you're... Life energy spins and works. They're already there. You already have them. You just have to identify them, figure out who they are and what they need, and then ask God to work in you to meet the needs that these folks have. Now, I want, I want to be very careful here. You are not doing this to sort of manipulate them so that you can share the gospel with them. Okay? Okay? Get this. Get this. 
It doesn't say love your neighbors and then evangelize them. Okay? This is not a program. Okay? This is not another evangelistic program. This is a very simple and direct command that God has given us. Love your neighbors, period. End of discussion. I, I, I believe that we ought to think about sharing the gospel when we have opportunities. But loving your neighbor is not... It's not connected to that. It is standalone, important in and of itself. You could love your neighbors. I had a neighbor in Philadelphia. And again, he, he liked to care for his yard. His, his grass always looked nicer than my grass. Let's always be honest. He, he just really took care of his grass very nicely. And I, real, I began to realize that was our common thing. So I mean, you kind of laugh at this, but I'd be working in my garden, and I'd smell his cigar, okay? He smoked those big cigars. I'd smell his cigar, and I'd stop doing what I was doing in my garden, and I'd walk over and talk to him and help what he was doing in his garden. That was my strategy. That was my only strategy. As far as I could tell, that was the only thing I had in common with him is we both liked to work in our yard. But so when he was outside, he always had his cigar in his mouth. When I smelled his cigar smoke, I went next door and said hello to him and, and helped him do what he was doing. One day he said to me, I see you leaving on Sunday morning to go to church every week. Are you religious? I'd never once said the word Jesus in his presence. I, 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 just, I just showed up when I smelled cigar smoke. That was, my, that was the extent of my strategy. To be a neighbor, I just showed up when I smelled cigar smoke. And, and he began to talk to me about the deep woundedness of his past and how he had been deeply hurt by a church and how he vowed that he would never again darken the, 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 the church, the doors of a church. He said, but I kind of like you. <laughs> and, and that began our pilgrimage together as neighbors. And if you asked Rob and Mary, did Doug and Kathy love them? They knew that we did. I don't know your neighbors, but you've got you to gotta figure this out, folks. Church, you've got you to gotta figure this out. It's, it, this is not optional church 101. All the law and the prophets hang on two things. Love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Oh, when, when Bob got his Corvette... Candy apple red Corvette. It was the sweetest Corvette I'd ever seen. I got the first ride <laughs> in Bob's Corvette. I felt pretty loved. <laughs> so it turns out that God does have a pretty amazing marketing plan, doesn't he? It's pretty simple. It's you and me. We have been entrusted with some sphere of influence. Okay, where we live and work, where we play, where our kids engage with the neighborhood, that, that's your church. That's your parish. That's your ministry center. That's where God wants you to love people. And, and when I look at the expanse of the sanctuary and I think about where all you are, this church has a tremendous impact on, the na on, the, on this area. If you will, love your neighbor. You know who's in your circle. Do, do they know you love them? And then keep asking yourself this question. How would they know that I love them? Paul writes about the Corinthians. He said, uh, do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourself are our letters, written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, written not with ink but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone but on tablets of human heart. You cannot not be an influence. 
you are an influence. You cannot not be an influence in that sphere where God has placed you. But the question is, what, what kind of influence will you be for the sake of the gospel? This is God's clear and simple and compelling will for us. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let's, let's pray. Lord Jesus, right now I ask that you would put some names and faces into our minds of our neighbors. Maybe they don't have names. Maybe they're just faces right now, Lord, but would you put those faces and names into our minds so that we can identify the people you've given us to love right now. Spirit of God, Awaken us to the job that you have for us to love our neighbors. Because we know how much you love us. You loved us enough to send your son. While we were still rebellious, you sent Jesus. And we know that you love us, and we know that you love our neighbors. And so, Lord, would you right now give us that conviction born of the Spirit, that conviction that born from your word, that conviction shown by your son, that conviction that was commanded to us by King Jesus, would you plant that conviction in our hearts and help, help us to begin even today to love our neighbors as we love ourselves so that you might be honored by our actions and so that the world might come to know that you are the one true living God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a moment of uh, call to action, conviction. Uh, I'm just curious, and maybe this is a good way for you to uh, just to say, I I'll stand with the word of God today. I I'm going to ask in just a minute, if you're willing to hear the word, and, and respond to the Spirit, that if you'll just say, I'll, I'll start to try to do this. I'll, I'll, com I'll, I'll commit myself to that. Would you just stand for just a moment and say, I'm in. I'm in because of the Word of God. I'm in. I, 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 I promise that I will find some way, starting today, to love the people around me in ways that I've not done before, in ways that will convince them that the gospel is true and that they are loved. Lord Jesus, see this stand of commitment, committed people. Now send the Spirit. Release the Spirit. Release the Spirit into these neighborhoods, into these offices, in these schools. Release the Spirit so that you, your name might be honored and glorified in all the world. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.